Okay, so in this video, I am going to show you a function called depn.waterfall. This builds on my previous videos and previous functions uh, around depreciation schedules. So first of all, let me show you how it works. So it's as simple as waterfall. And then in this example, I'll put in the by year table and the double declining balance function. And then because this, these purchase dates are by year, I'm going to use the start date of 2017, and then the end will be 21 years after 2017. So that'll be 2038. And it will default to the by year period function, and it will default to horizontal. So I don't need to provide those parameters. So you can see that it produces this array. There's one row per asset, and then there's a total row. And for each year, we see the depreciation of that asset in that year, and then the sum of the depreciation for that year. And you can see that as the useful lives of the respective assets run out, the depreciation stops being attributed to them, and it continues until the last asset is finished. Similarly to the previous video, I'm going to just walk through the code uh, rather than writing it from scratch. So we've got four mandatory parameters here and two optional parameters. So the code starts by checking that the mandatory parameters are present. So we create this omitted variable, which is the sum of the is omitted function applied to each of those four parameters. And using the sum in this way is, uh, is similar to saying if or is applying the or function to these four parameters, those four functions. And so if any of these are omitted, this omitted variable will be true. And if it is true, rather than trying to return uh, an incorrect function, we will see this message instead. So if any of the four required parameters are missing, we will see this string. So let me just show you what that looks like, just so you can get an idea. So if I take the purchase table out, you can see that it gets the error message. Let's just put that back. So that's just some very basic error checking at the beginning. Next, uh, we're assuming that we do have values for those parameters. And we start by assigning a short name to the asset table so that it won't be repeated in its long form throughout the function. Next, we are handling uh, omitted period function. And uh, remember the period function is optional. So if the user decides not to provide it, the default function to use for the period function will be the by year function. And that's what I did in this example here. Otherwise, if it has been provided, it will use that. Similarly for the vertical um, parameter, if it's omitted, the default is false. So the default array orientation is horizontal for this function. Otherwise, use whatever the user has passed into the vertical parameter. Now, this step here relies on another namespace and another function. And I'm going to just cover that very, very briefly. But essentially, we have a function assigned to this period function variable and the period function requires, um, it requires two parameters, but has an optional third parameter, which when passed as true, will instead of returning details or data using the period function, it will in fact return the metadata of the period function. And let me just talk about that briefly now. So remember period function, is one of two values. It's either depn.byYear or it's depn.byMonth. And those functions are up here. So here they are, by month and by year. They're in the depn namespace. And if we look inside these functions, we can see that they take three parameters, two uh, required, the number of periods and the start period. And this third parameter, which is optional, which is return metadata. Now, the idea here is if if we pass true into return metadata, essentially these first two are ignored. And what we return instead is this. So 
if return metadata is true, return the metadata. Otherwise, return the calculation defined for this period function. In the case of by year, it's start plus periods. The metadata is defined by this function call to this meta.data function. And we pass in the name of the function, a description of the function, and the author of the function. Now, in this case, I've put myself as the author in the namespace author name within the DEPN namespace. And you can see that at the top here. I'm the namespace author. And here I've used that value to pass it into this metadata for this period function. Now, metadata, the meta.data function is super simple. It just takes the three values, name, description, and author. And it, first of all, v-stacks those, so it stacks them on top of each other. And then it uses the meta.titles, which are here. And that's just three rows, one column with name, description, and author. And it h-stacks, horizontally stacks those with the values passed into the function. So just to show you what that looks like, if we use meta.data and um, let's say, no, we don't need to use meta.data, forgive me. We need to use DEPN dot by year. We can put any values here because they're going to be ignored. And if we put a true here, it will return the metadata. And the metadata has the name, which is the function name. It has the description, which is this text. And it has the author, which is my name. So because of this, if we come back into the DEPN um, namespace, because of this, if we pass true into by year, we return, we get a, an array of three rows and two columns one cell of which contains the function name. Now this is important for the waterfall, as we will see um, in a moment. So by passing a true here, what we've returned into this period function MD variable is that array of metadata. Now we need that array because we need to decide what to do based on the name of the function that was passed as the period function. So we're using switch. We are checking the first row, the second column of the metadata, which is the function name. If the function name is depn.byyear, then the number of periods in the waterfall will be end minus start plus one. So that will be the calculation of the difference from the end year and the start, start year. If the function name is by month, then the calculation will be the date difference in months between the start and the end plus one. So that will be how we will count and calculate the number of periods and therefore the number of columns that we will create in the output array. Moving onwards, um, we are using the period function to calculate an array of period labels. And we are passing into it the sequence, which is as long as the period count, so the count of columns we want in the output, starting at zero. And we're passing the start year into this function. I'm not going to go into detail about how by year and by month work. There's another video about that. You're welcome to watch it, or you're welcome to study the code. Suffice to say, it returns an array of period labels. In the case on the screen, it's an array of years. Next, we create a stack of schedules for the assets in the table. There is a completely separate video showing you what schedule stack does. It returns a vertical table with the, the depreciation schedules for each of the assets stacked on top of each other. If you'd like to learn how that works, you're welcome to watch that video as well. So next we are, first of all, um, getting the names of the assets from the table. So this is choose columns, choose column one from the table into assets. So that will be a, a one column, three row array containing machinery, software, and robotic T server. Next, we need a function that is going to look up a value from the schedule stack and match it to the period labels that we defined previously. So this is how we got, we're going to know to put 224,000 in this cell for 2020 for software. We're gonna use this get asset depreciation function to search the schedule stack for that year, for that 
asset name and return the value into the cell. And um, essentially it is just filtering the schedule stack by the current asset name, which will be passed in as X. And we are then using XLOOKUP to find the correct uh, values from that particular schedule and match them against the period labels. So I won't go into detail about how XLOOKUP works. You probably know that already and we're running out of time. So I'm gonna keep going. Okay, so next we are going to build a vertical array of the uh, depreciation schedules for each of the assets aligned with the period labels, i.e. the years uh, that we defined earlier. So to do so, we're using this reduce function. It takes three parameters. The first parameter is the initial value, i.e. where are we starting from? And this statement here returns the the depreciation of the first row in a list of assets, so that's machinery, and it calculates the depreciation and aligns the results with the period labels. So it aligns the results with the years. Now remember, this is vertically. The second parameter is the array we wish to scan through because it reduces a scanning function. And since we've already got the first uh, column, we drop the first asset such that the array we're scanning through is only the remaining items. So in this case, only software and robotic T server. The third parameter is this Lambda function, which has two parameters itself, the accumulator and the current row. And what we're doing here is we are horizontally stacking the results from the previous iteration with the aligned depreciation for the current asset. So on the first iteration, the start value is the machinery depreciation aligned against the period labels. So that's what constitutes A. We then horizontally stack with that the depreciation for the software aligned with the same period labels. And that's why this H stack works is because these two have the same number of rows. On the second iteration, A is then the depreciation of both machinery and software in separate columns aligned against the period labels and get asset depreciation for B is the same process for the robotic T server. So the result is that schedules is a three column array with the same number of rows as the period labels array. So the same number of rows as there are years in this example, uh, and that's three columns. So that represents these rows here. <clears throat> So this wouldn't be much use without uh, a total row. So here we create a total row. We are scanning the vertical array, which is called schedules. Now remember that vertical array is these three rows here, transposed. And for each row, looking at it this way, it's for each column, we are summing that row, which gives us the result here. Of course, in a vertical array, we would transpose this, but you just kind of have to imagine that. Uh, the final step is to produce the result. And the result, again, is a vertical array, remember. So what we're doing here is we are putting everything together, the period labels in, a, in the first column, the schedules of which there are three columns. So that's column one, that's column two, three, and four, and the totals, which is uh, going to be column five. So that's a horizontal stack. On top of that, we are going to vertically stack the headers. So there's going to be a blank, which is this cell here. We're going to have the transpose of the assets. Now remember, assets itself is a vertical array. So the transpose of the assets becomes a horizontal array of three items, which aligns with the schedules array. And then finally, the text total in the fifth column. So the result of this is a vertical array with column headers. And finally, we say, if the variable return vertical is true, then simply return the result the way it is. If it's not true, which is the default, we transpose it and return it horizontally. So that's, that's the result and that's how we get this.
Just as a final comment, I just want to mention that because we pass the start and end years into the function, we can change these to be any sub uh, sub selection of the years in this array without changing the calculations because each of the depreciation schedules are calculated separately from these two parameters. So if I only wanted to look at the next five years, I could change this to 2022 to um, 2026. And that only returns five years, but these uh, numbers here are calculated correctly according to the year purchased and the useful life of each of the assets in this result. So that really is the end of the video, and thank you for watching.